Okay, good morning, everyone, and welcome to what is now the 33rd edition of the Coffee Microcaps morning meeting. Um, my name is Mark Tobin. I'm the founder of Coffee Microcaps for anybody who is joining us for the first time and for all our regular attendees, uh, you're very welcome back. And I'm just going to quickly run through these slides and then we're going to get straight into it with our first presenter. For anybody joining us for the first time, just to give you a bit of an overview, uh, we have two companies presenting generally every fortnight, although more recently we've been doing these every week over the course of the next hour. Each company gets a 30 minute slot, which is roughly broken down into a 20 minute presentation, and then we'll throw it open to 10 minutes of Q&A or thereabouts at the end. If you do have any questions, please type them in the Q&A box uh, rather than the chat function. Just makes it easier to manage the Q&A session when we get to it. Please note that this webinar is being recorded and it will be posted on the Coffee Microcats YouTube channel. So if a presenter flips over a particular slide too quickly or you want to watch it back, um, it will be up on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel probably tomorrow morning about nine, half past nine. Uh, you can follow Coffee Microcaps, uh, you can follow us on Twitter. Uh, as I said, the YouTube for the recording of this webinar and all the previous webinars that we've done. Uh, you can get us on LinkedIn from some additional long form content. I also write a weekly paid AS6 Microcap newsletter, which you can find on the Coffee Microcaps Substack newsletter platform. Uh, our first presenter this morning is Mr. Peter Cook from Novati Group. And after Peter, then we're going to have Mr. Rob Broomfield from Ava Risk Group. So without further ado, I am going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to hand over to Peter. I'm delighted to say Peter's coming back, joining us again. The last time he was on with us was uh, back in February. And uh, hopefully some of our viewers have uh, caught the... 65% share rise uh, since Peter was last here. So he's got a high bar to, to uh, hurdle uh, now, now on this presentation if we're, if we're going to match that in the next four or five months. Peter, over to you. Hey, uh, th thank, thanks very much, Mark. Um, you've got the slide? I do indeed, yeah. I can see yep. Jamie Diamond just here now. <laughs> okay, so... Um... Uh, so good morning all and I thought I'd start with my last slide just uh, as a bit of a um, uh, an icebreaker as it were for morning coffee as I sit here in Melbourne awaiting news of our uh, next lockdown but anyway um, uh, so Novati we're, we're absolutely in the fintech space um, we've uh, as Mark said had a, a very good price appreciation v very much since um, uh, the presentation uh, to, to this audience on the 4th of February. And, you know, it's been great to uh, be, ha have that sort of appreciation and recognition. Um, but uh, going back into my proper presentation, um, if I just start with core thematic, and, and one thing I've really appreciated watching these is to hear some of the fund managers talk about, you know, what, what is their investment thesis. So if I can start with, uh, our sort of thesis, and and hopefully it becomes a super investment thesis. But if you believe that digital transformation of financial services is here to stay and is a big thing, then uh, we have positioned ourselves to be uh, a B two B, an underlying B two B player, um, servicing that that digital transformation of financial services in Australia and in fact overseas as well. So we try to be a little bit of the uh, bricks, uh, so sorry, the uh, picks and shovels to the mines. Um, and, you know, you'll see from our, our financial results that there, there is strong growth in revenues and an expansion of services into the market. So we, we say that we are a leading digital banking and payments fintech. Uh, our customers are primarily other fintechs uh, banks, correspondent banks, uh, large enterprises, financial services institutions, 
um, we are providing services to them as an underlying B2B provider. Uh, the history of the business we, we listed in January 2016 uh, and, and really um, we've uh, been able to build over that time a, a significant capability of services, of platforms, whether it be licenses, technology, people and, and uh, you know we've been able to show uh, consistent strong revenue growth over the last three years. Uh, quarter on quarter on quarter for the last uh, eight quarters, we've been able to show strong revenue growth. And, and I think uh, the market has started to recognise that. We, our announcements last year were very much about showing some of the, the partners we'd been able to sign up with to increase our ecosystem and capabilities. And then this year, we've been able to show in some of our announcements, uh, the monetization of that network, which I'll, I'll get to a bit later. I'll just skip through on the, the board, but we have a, a highly experienced board. Um, and in particular, uh, two of the directors live overseas. Um, and uh, three of us have, uh, sorry, four of us have extensive background in payments. And Peter Pavlovich, our chairman, is involved also in Dubber Family Zone and VRX. So re really experienced chairman. Um, but again, on, on sort of macro, uh, forces, uh, the one that we've seen exacerbated by COVID, uh, the, the shift to cashless payments, and you know we are very exposed to that. The, the super thesis to me, which is digital transformation, which is happening in all sectors, but in particular in financial services and payments and, and banking. Um, we're also addressing some new markets uh, that we're seeing with, with apps and um, uh, uh, new sorts of services coming to market. Um, significant disruption created by um, uh, of traditional players and, and an interesting uh, point effect of, in Australia has been the, the Royal Commission, where we've seen, as an example, the traditional banks, uh, our big four banks, um, resolve for, or move back from services such as insurance, wealth management, and, and also payments. And then all of the markets we deal into uh, are absolutely massive markets. Um, so very, very high uh, target addressable markets in whether it be in what we call issuing, acquiring, cross-border payments, just huge addressable markets. Um, uh, going on to our revenue streams, we, we essentially see that we have uh, five revenue streams as such. Um, issuing, uh, where we uh, issue uh, prepaid visa cards, um, acceptance um, where we we are or acquiring where we are taking payments at merchants um, uh, processing and cross-border payments which uh, is, is a major revenue stream for us that's payments out of Australia payments into Australia and in fact in some cases payments between third-party countries um, we have a very strong business we bought it a year ago called immersion which is a platform for subscription billing and, and automation of businesses. And then an underlying uh, revenue stream for us, about $5 million a year comes from technology and platform sales. It's, it's an area of the business that, you know, per se, we're not trying to grow, but it, it just provides great revenues underneath the business. Um, over the last year, we, as I said, we've been trying to uh, focus on, on building the, the network and the ecosystem and, and one of the great proof points is some of the absolute tier one global players that we've been able to bring on as partners. Um, Visa, which is underpinning our, our issuing business, um, but equally we're one of the few companies in Australia that's um, fully integrated to Google Pay, Samsung Pay um, and, and Apple Pay for, for um, uh, issuing. Uh, we, we are connected to Ripple, the cross-border uh, payments network, which is, you know, related to the, the cryptocurrency XRP for cross-border payments. Marketa, which is, you know, a huge company in the US, which is just an absolute specialist in prepaid cards. So range of services there, um, range of, of tier one partners that have said, okay, Novati is a, a player in Australia. They're public listed. They've got licenses. They're technically very strong. We'll work with them. 
And then uh, more this calendar year where we've really been able to show how we've monetized some of those partnerships. Now, probably the uh, major one by brand is Afterpay. We, we are underpinning their, um, their launch in New Zealand. So, it, you know, for a little bit of, you know, potted history on that, um, we uh, got a um, license in New Zealand from their regulator for us to be able to issue product. We then worked with Visa to extend our Australian license to New Zealand to be called to become what's called an associate issuer. And then we could work with Afterpay to enable the virtual cards inside their wallet system so that they could launch um, a couple of weeks ago in New Zealand with us, uh, with Navati being the, the underpinning payment device within that um, Afterpay wallet. Uh, with Ripple, we, we announced that late last year and then we've, um, uh, we've integrated the first country and partner, the Philippines with a company I remit. Uh, Thailand, we should um, be able to show the market over the next few weeks that, that we're integrated to, um, into Thailand and we'll keep um, add, adding countries to that network. And then two very modern wallet uh, systems, uh, Lit and LifePay, uh, both with uh, multiple thousands of users, have launched new sorts of uh, digital wallet services in Australia and we provide the underpinning um, payments device or pa sorry payments instrument being a visa card inside the wallets and and also a lot of their payments infrastructure as we connect those wallets to, to the Australian payments network so all, all you know what, what we're showing there is that uh, we're increasingly monetizing the ecosystem we've been building and just uh, for, for those uh, that know that we've been uh, let's call it uh, pregnant for a long time. We're trying to get a, a bank license. Um, we, we were ready to get one in about March, April last year. APRA put a hold on it uh, for a year. The, the, uh, that freeze has now been uh, opened up again. We, we have taken in a significant investment from uh, the FEC group owned BC Invest from Hong Kong and, and also Australia. Uh, as, as a cornerstone in, in the, uh, the future bank. The um, BC Invest is a, a lender in Australia and provides a range of strategic capabilities to us. Um, and as per a recent announcement, we, we've arranged what we call Series A funding into the subsidiary for us that will hold the bank licence. Uh, so it's, it's a uh, not, not dilutory for, for Novati at the headstock level. And we will, uh, at the end of this process on uh, receipt of a restricted bank license, Novati will own about 57% of that. And, and then we can prosecute the banking business um, as a part owned entity uh, through to a full license. And then, um, you know, possibly over the next couple of years, its own listing or, um, you, know, you know, further investment by other majors. Looking at some of our financial results um, from the March quarter, uh, sales revenue first time through $4 million um, at $4.15 million. Um, we had cash on hand at that point of about $6 million. And in fact, as part of the uh, FEC BC invest, uh, investment into the bank, a further $3 million came into Novati a couple of weeks ago. Um, the, the, the sales revenue for the last three quarters has been $11.5 million, which is more than it was uh, for the entirety of last year. And we, we are showing a uh, year on growth on sales revenue of about 37%. And, and actually the work within the company is to, to actually try and accelerate that. We did a major fundraising of about $10 million in July last year and have really been um, you, you know, doing a lot of work to, to accelerate that growth. Um, in terms of with, within that $4 million of revenue, about $3 million was from transaction processing. That's showing 77% year on year growth. So, um, and, and we're seeing further acceleration of that hopefully in, in the coming quarters. So within the core business of financial transaction processing, we're getting very, very strong growth. And then just, I guess in, in summary, Mark, uh, coming back to 
the, the core investment theses, why would someone invest in Novati? Um, just, just these macro forces, as I said, of digital transformation of, of financial services, changing of the guard of, of you know, who is offering services into the marketplace, um, care of things such as the Royal Commission and very large addressable markets. We've spent a lot of time establishing our ecosystem and we're now monetizing a lot of that. We have very, very significant end-to-end -end capabilities, issuing, acquiring, processing, cross-border. We've got a range of licenses in Australia and overseas, um, a, a range of really good commercial agreements and a very strong management team that, that has got significant experience in, in payments and banking. Um, we have a strong balance sheet. Uh, as I said, $6 million at the end of March, a further $3 million raised since. So we're you know, in good shape in a balance sheet to continue to drive growth. And, and we do have a very, very strong growth strategy. Um, uh, and and you know, within that multiple but related revenue streams as a, as a multi-services payments service provider, B2B provider into the, the whole FinTech transformation um, I, I hope that, uh, that that's a good thesis for your listeners. Thank you very much. Uh, thanks, Peter. Peter, could you just yeah flip back to maybe the first slide that has your contact details on it? We'll just yep. there we go. We'll just leave that up for for the Q and A. We've got one in from the audience, and I got one or two emailed in ahead of time. So let's uh, let's take the one from the audience first. Um, the upside of banking was shown, however, the likes of Zinja have also shown the risk of trying to start a regulated bank. What's Novahi's strategy to ensure the bank subsidiary doesn't become a, a black hole of lost money and, and tied up capital, I think might be the, the question. Yes, so, so it's really interesting. Um, we've, let's say, had four startup banks. We've had uh, and, and, uh, Shinja, which has you know, as, as the reader has pointed out, um, not, not succeeded uh, and has had to hand its money back and a, a loss of shareholder funds. Uh, Vault is another one that, that is sort of, you, you know, uh, sputtering along, but, but I think just starting to take off. We, we've had 86400, which uh, I think had about 80 or $90 million of shareholder funds and was sold for about $220 million. So there was hundred odd million dollars of upside for the investors. And Judo Bank, which is, I'm not sure how much it's raised, maybe five or $700 million. And, and I think it's last raising was at about 1.5 or $1.7 billion. But, but the real answer, so, so we've had, you know, certainly two strong successes. Uh, I think the real thing, Mark, is that you need to have a very strong business plan. You need to be diligent on your expenditure of funds uh, and, um, I guess you've got to get product in the market early. Now, in, in, in our uh, future bank's case, it, it's leveraging off a lot of Novartis uh, customers. Um, and it's also with, with our new cornerstone investor, it'll leverage off a lot of the work they do. So w w we have a business plan that goes to migrant banking services and cross-border payments. It, it relates to a lot of what we've already done. Um, we're very much, uh, we're very, very light on in uh, cost and, and expense, how we'll run the bank. And so, you know, we, we are very bullish that we've got our own business model and, and our own, let's call it blue ocean to attack. Okay, great. And then one question I had just going through you think you, you reference, I think it was on the third or fourth slide, you know, one in two Australians have opened a digital wallet in the, in the last 12 months. Um, in that, in that report, I'm guessing you're, you're pulling it from maybe APRA or somebody. Where are we in terms of digital wallets penetration, maybe broadly across the market? You know, I'm just trying to get a sense of, you know, where we are in that kind of evolution you know, from cash to debit cards, credit cards, to now into full-on digital wallets, if that, if that makes sense. Yeah, so um, it's hard to me, for me to be, I'll say, exact on this, but, but we're seeing, you know, users get educated very quickly um, and maybe not as you expect. So, for instance, you, you know, probably the a vast majority of of uh, iPhone users have now used sort of Apple Pay and, and the Apple Wallet for one thing or another. 
Um, you know, same with with uh, Android phone users. So, so they get introduced to it. Um, I, I look at LifePay, which has got I think about eight or ten thousand customers. Lit's got about uh, they certainly had about seventeen or eighteen thousand customers about a month or so ago, um, and and other services. So people, you know, get introduced to them, get used to to these services. Um, uh, even you know, I'll say uh, in in a training sense, even having a um, being an account holder for uh, your frequent fly program for Qantas, essentially that's a wallet. You know, how many points have I got? Um, what services can I can I buy from that wallet? So, so uh, the Australian consumer base has been educated on wallets, and now it's going to be adoption based on on services being offered. Okay, great. And then another question on the revenue lines: Can you maybe just break yeah. out how they actually generate revenue? You know, is it a, a fixed fee plus a percentage of the transaction? Or do you guys just charge a transaction percentage on everything? You know, those four or five revenue lines. Can you just maybe break out how you make money on each one of those? Yeah. So starting with the, I'll call it the, the non-growth one, which is about $5 million a year, which is technology and platform services. Most of that is, is a mixture of license fees and professional services as per a SaaS or enterprise software sales model. And then of the, the remainder of the business, which is the growth side around transaction processing, um, it depends a little bit on the service. In nearly all cases, we are getting a mixture of monthly fees um, and service fees, and then some transaction fees. And then, the, the, and, um, and as as I say, in most cases, we're trying to position ourselves as a B2B provider. So, you know, we, we might provide a white label uh, visa issuing service to another fintech. We, we, we might get, you know, figuratively an upfront fee of thirty dollars or $50,000. We might get three dollars or five or $10,000 a month, and then we might get a transaction fee. So depending on exactly what we're doing, it's a mixture of... Um, Let's call it project fees, monthly fees, and transaction fees. Okay, great. And then another question, kind of a, I think it's a, stemming from a, a lot of the misfortunes of another, let's say, financial services company. Um, you know, regulatory yeah. risk for for your business if you know one of your customers you know, gets pinged by a regulator either in Australia or overseas, you know, can that come back on Novati Group or, you know, is is the license risk more with your customer rather than, than with you guys or where, or where does that license uh, risk sit? Yeah, so uh, tough question, Mark. Uh, the, the We're pretty fastidious about what we do. So we have... Um, at the moment, I think it's 11 people in our compliance area, including five lawyers. Um, and so we, we spend, you know, we, we've got an AFSL, we've got a, a, um, a remittance network provider license in Australia. We're obviously in, in a separate way licensed by Visa. Um, so, you know, you can only uh, be fastidious, which is what we are, and and just follow the regulations and be as strong as possible. Now, working with other fintechs, normally your contractual agreements is, you know, shifting obligations to them to, to make sure that they're doing their, their part of the process as well. Okay, great. Um, I'm just going to check now, have we got any more uh, questions from the audience? I'll give it a minute in case anybody wants to jump in here quickly with another question and uh, while we're waiting for that peter um what are some of the the key things that people i guess if we, if we look over the, the balance of calendar year 21 it, it is the yeah. biggest thing the next biggest thing i guess for novati is it uh, the banking license or should we be also on the lookout for maybe another maybe part major partnership agreement or or a series of minor partnership agreements that that cumulatively add up to a 
you know, a step change in any one of those revenue lines. Yeah. So I think that uh, I'll call it from major news flow. Uh, ho hopefully we'll be able to announce the uh, a bank licence uh, in the you know, near to medium term. That's, you know, been the culmination of three plus years of work. And, you know, we, we've, as best as possible, tried to keep the market abreast of the work we are doing with APRA there. Uh, the end, end of July, our quarterly results, uh, and, and hopefully the market will see, um, you know, a continuation of the, the sorts of trends that we've been able to show over the last eight quarters. Uh, a, a continual flow, hopefully, of, of new both um, uh, fintech sort of partnership agreements and enterprise agreements, uh, just, you know, further uh, uplifting our revenues and, and you know, validation of, of work. Um, and then I think maybe specifically, we, we launched the immersion in, in the US uh, just before the end of March. Um, and, you know, we, we should see, uh, again, some proofs of, of the work we've made and, and the expenditure we've made on immersion to lift that platform to the US and really start to extend that. Uh, and, and then I guess in general, uh, we've also said that part of our strategy is M&A and you know, like I guess most companies on the ASX, we, we spend a fair bit of time uh, looking for M&A activity. It's, it's a, quite a process to get, get, get suitable companies into the funnel and, you know, run them through due diligence and everything else and, and get one out the bottom of the funnel. It's not insignificant, but it's, it's activity we're doing all the time. Okay, Peter, that's great. Um, if we don't have any further questions from the audience, I know oh, we have one more. Um, what's the percentage of revenue from Australia and the US and uh, where would that be in a year's time or, or maybe where, where, do you, where would you, maybe if we change that mm -hmm. around to, you know, where would you like to see it in, in, uh, in a year's time in terms of that split between, you know, USD based revenue from immersion and and uh, Aussie dollar based revenue from the rest of the business. Yeah, so so immersion today has zero revenue from the US, and you know I, I would hope that that we can, you know, very broad range. But you know, if in if in the first twelve months of operating in the US, if we can pull, I don't know, a million US plus or minus for revenue there, which is the first year of a SaaS business, that would be outstanding. Uh, and then once we've got that toehold toe really drive, you know, accelerate, you know, really accelerate that growth. <clears throat> we do get about, we get over a million US of revenue at the moment um, from uh, other billing services we provide under the basis two brand in the US. Uh, and then we do have some other US dollar revenues not coming from the US, but from uh, um, Asia, Africa, the Middle East for some technology clients we've got there. Uh, in terms of the, the split in, in a year's time, uh, the, 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 the current billing basis two revenues will be about the same, a bit over a million US. As I said, if we can get a million US in, in the next 12 months plus out of immersion, that would be outstanding and, and then really building from there. It, it's possible, like in a strategic sense, that we also put payment processing at the back of immersion, which, which is one of the original points of buying the business, is that we put, um, we add our merchant acquiring services uh, onto the, the, the um, subscription billing platform. So, so if we can also arrange that uh, and you know, get that satisfactory working over the next three to six months in the US, and that will actually increase the US revenues as well. Okay, great, Peter. We're going to leave it there. Thank you very much hey, again for coming back and presenting to the Coffee Microcaps audience. It's uh, great to have some returning guests. If you could please stop sharing your screen, yeah, and yeah. we will hand over to Rob, who I know is waiting in the wings for us. Okay, thank you, Mark. Thanks, Peter. And Rob, if you want to start sharing yours, that'd be great. I will let you know as soon as it comes up on our side, it's just coming now. 
I can see the cover slide of your presentation now, Rob, so you're good to go. I'm just going to get Rob off of uh, mute. Uh, good morning, Mark. Can you hear me now? I can hear you now, Rob. You're, you're right. loud and clear. Right. Okay, look, look, thanks, Mark, for the opportunity to uh, be able to present the AVA risk group uh, to this morning's coffee microcaps morning meeting. So, you know, what does, uh, what does AVA risk group do? Essentially, we protect high value assets in critical infrastructure. Uh, we do this through the development and delivery of innovative technologies and services. Uh, these technologies and services are applicable to a number of very large markets globally, everywhere from banking through to military um, and the other industries highlighted on this particular slide. So the AVA Risk Group has got three companies um, that are developing and providing these critical asset protection solutions. I'll, I'll talk in more detail about each of them in the slide deck, but just to give you an overview, under the technologies, we have two companies. There's Future Fibre Technology, or FFT. Uh, they provide a range of fibre optic based sensing solutions for security applications and are in the process of extending these platforms into what we call condition monitoring. Uh, BQT, they provide a unique and custom access control sol solutions uh, used by large government agencies and departments and other critical infrastructure such as banking, transport. They also provide very innovative smart locking solutions that are attracting global interest in terms of their unique capabilities. Um, from the slide, you can see both FFT and BQT are well proven and have a history of delivering solutions globally and a significant number of installations and sites currently deployed. AVA Logistics provide uh, international or secure international logistics services uh, for precious metal and currency. And it has a somewhat unique business model in the industry. Um, they use in-country uh, logistics providers, uh, and this is a differentiation from most of the major players in this particular market. And again, I'll cover that off in a bit more detail further in the presentation. Um, regarding go to market, well, look, um, having the best technology or services really is not enough and to grow and successfully deploy these services and technologies, the go-to-market design is crucial and the implementation of them. For technology, um, really the business development process starts at the end user, obviously educating, and then you've obviously got the uh, primarily system integrators that are involved with the high-end solutions that get involved. So this awareness has to go all the way through from end user through system integrators and then obviously we use that to provide our solution as part of a total integrated solution on large sites. We're expanding the go-to-market with uh, FFT to do a lot more licensing and services. And again, I'll cover that off in the future slides. The BQT go-to-market for the locking solution is primarily through specialist locking distributors but for its access control custom solutions, it tends to follow the system integrator route that uh, I discussed for future fiber technologies. With AVA Global for their services, they obviously develop relationships, contracts and agreements with the end users uh, to manage the entire logistics process, but they do fulfill in-country uh, parts of the service through their very large partner network. AVA Risk Group, we're globally focused and we have global reach. Uh, the vast majority of our customers are in the Northern Hemisphere. Uh, we have solutions deployed everywhere from the Arctic Circle to the deserts, to the tropics. Uh, essentially, there's nowhere on the planet we can't provide an effective solution for critical infrastructure protection. Um, you'll see from the graphs of the first half, uh, about half the revenue for the group came from AVA Global the services do, uh, part of the company, and approximately half of the group profit came from Future Fiber Technologies. The, the genesis of the AVA Risk Group goes back really to the mid 1990s where FFT was essentially an R&D company doing uh, photonics sensing research 
for government agencies. Um, at the start of the 2000s, it turned to a manufacturer when it released the world's first long range security sensor. And the first installation around the world was actually associated with large air base infrastructure where post 9-11, the customer was looking for technology to provide intrusion detection around large, large infrastructure and immediately understood FFT's unique capabilities. And by the way, that first customer is still a strong FFT customer 20 years later. Um, over the coming years, FFT technology expanded both in hardware and software capabilities and bit by bit global acceptance grew for this type of technology. Uh, they listed on the ASX in 2015, uh, merged with Maxet Group um, at the uh, at the end of 2000. And, oh, sorry, the yeah, end of 2017, and within Maxec were was BQT and uh, the then startup uh, services company Ava Global. Um, through 2018, well, uh, we changed the name to Ava Risk Group. Um, from our FFT technology perspective, it's important to note the release of what we call the Aura AI platform, which has grown and we're taking into a number of new markets. Both uh, BQT and AVA capabilities have grown since then. And obviously their capabilities have been validated through significant contract wins in recent years. So over the past three years, the group revenue has grown around 50% per annum. I think more importantly though, is the profit growth, uh, which has been even stronger. And th this profit growth isn't due to just top line revenue. It's really also due to a very strong OPEX focus uh, by management and also a focus on gross margin improvements through the go-to-market expansion and refinement. So this growth has been really driven, the profit growth has had a number of uh, attributes to it from great execution by the management team. And obviously we've got forecasts there in terms of uh, the current financial year. So if we look at um, you know, the macro trends, I think everyone's aware that critical infrastructure security is growing in concern with governments globally and that they are investing, or in some cases, legislating to mandate increase in security of that critical infrastructure. Also, the global connectivity actually opens up opportunities, and, and for many, it also has threats in terms of cyber assurance. Um, what we actually see it as a huge uh, growth potential in terms of the way we deliver services, like software upgrades, but also how we how we package and the value that we put into those, uh, those software packages in terms of cyber assurance. And obviously for an AVA global perspective, the industry macro trends are consolidation within the uh, global secure logistics industry. And, and that's actually something that will assist them in their growth. So from a business driver's perspective, you know, uh, technologies, connectivity, cyber assurance, you know, service, uh, software as a service, um, all of those things are becoming relevant to the industries we serve and the products that we're designing and also extending into you know, new areas, new applications where we believe the technology uh, fits very well and brings further innovation into those industries. Uh, AVA Global, they're gonna continue their growth. They also get a bit of a multiplier effect as they get bigger they can also attract and, and go through the onboarding requirements of larger and larger customer sets in that particular industry. So where we are at the moment, we're experts, we're proven in high security sensing. Um, we have a very diversified model and a number of go-to-market strategies. The portfolio's premium end um, and our competitive position, our IP, our total cost of ownership benefits are obviously being uh, shown um, with customers globally. But looking forward, we're going to continue to um, drive our innovation through both our domain expertise and also the customer focus that we have in terms of attracting and, and capturing high end blue chip client base and making sure that we take that into our design of product and services. So we'll continue to build on that proven track record in delivering complex high value services and solutions. 
Um, I'll go into each of the companies in a little bit more detail and the first part will be the technology division, but I might just use this slide to explain very quickly what Future Fibre does as some people may not quite understand. So this graphic shows a bundle of individual optical fibres and with FFT's Aura platform, we will use one of those fibres. We'll inject laser light and we'll actually then monitor back at our controller the back reflections from the minor imperfections in that fiber so with this we can now look at that whole fiber and break it into small segments of half a meter and turn each half meter into a highly sensitive microphone so this fiber is standard industry fiber used in it networks the fiber or cables that are deployed are deployed along pipelines and we can convert that infrastructure into a sensor so one system, one aura system, can monitor well over 100 kilometres of fibre and turn it into a massive distributed array of something like 2,000 microphonic sensors that are extremely sensitive. So the position with FFT, um, obviously the key thing to note here was the FY 2021 you know, revenue growth and profitability growth. And that comes from obviously past work done on platforms but also the management focus in terms of the go-to-market and adding innovative go-to-market market, marketing approaches with uh, the licensing activity that we've got. Um, in terms of the current years, we have seen some COVID-19 impact, obviously getting to sites uh, and uh, site access has been a bit limited. So we've actually noticed about a deferral of about 6 million that we're expecting in the second half of this year, we'll move into the early part of next financial year. Nothing's been lost. And the good thing is that business development activity has been very, very strong, even despite the uh, impacts of COVID-19. So we're very confident about the year ahead. Um, the customers, they're all very much blue chip and our channel partners, distributors, system integrators are at the top end as well. So you'll see, uh, a matrix there of uh, you know, government, oil and gas, military, transport and utilities, and some of the world's biggest system integrators that we deal with. Um, the IMOD contract's an interesting one um, in that it was our first major licensing program, or first licensing program. And we worked through this, thought it through, implemented it very well, and obviously it was a major contributor um, you know, in the first half in terms of achieving very high margins from licensing revenue. It also has ongoing uh, revenues into the uh, next financial year, uh, not of the same size, but also then goes into a seven years annual maintenance contract um, licensing revenue after the initial warranty period. I think there's really two key points from this. Um, one is it's obviously has proven out a licensing model uh, for our future go-to-market expansion. It's also put us at the very, uh, uh, very much highly visible in terms of global IT security. And it also strengthens our position in India where we've been um, you know, considered quite seriously for another uh, round of major government programs that we're working on in the future. But Bora platform, has uh, capabilities well outside of security. So um, we're taking it into other areas and I'll talk to the first one conveyor um, shortly, but we have deployed a system for um, rail applications, in fact, a couple, not just around protecting infrastructure, static, static infrastructure, but also protecting or detecting rockfalls along railway lines. Um, we've obviously done some early work with roads where we use the sensors already, fibre optic sensors already deployed and can gather information about traffic activity or accidents. Um, we've already been proving that on subsea power cables, detecting boat anchor drops uh, in, in the proximity of the cables and can even see uh, the actual um, uh, watercraft travelling over the cable. We can detect all that information. Um, with IQ, it's, um, it's a little bit like when we first introduced the perimeter fibre optic solution. It's not known in the industry, so we're having to demonstrate the capability on site through what we call our proof of value with um, a number of mining companies internationally. And a number of those are closing out quite successfully, despite the delays we had with COVID-19 getting to site. 
and uh, we're very confident as that these are going through their internal approval processes and the ROI that they're generating is really quite significant. So this future platform, we're pretty, uh, we're proving out, we're getting great results from the POVs and as we commercialize it, it will start growing a revenue stream that will come from a SaaS model in that we'll be licensing this technology through either CapEx or a combined CapEx and OpEx. And the OpEx is a per meter per month license fee, which obviously builds a very strong recurring revenue. We'll also be deploying it as this grows through a partnership, a partner network with, uh, with really capable uh, mining technology companies that are in the countries with the customers close to the customer and that will be capable of actually uh, supporting and delivering these solutions globally. In terms of access control, um, you'll note, I think from this particular slide, the very high margins in the first half of this year. And, and that's really driven by uh, project wins with the access control product. So the access control custom product going to large government projects the, the uh, locking solutions, they are really very much focused upon the distribution market. So again, with BQT, they are at the very high end in terms of access control encryption and solutions for large organisations like governments have unique capabilities. And in terms of the locking solutions, the technology that they have actually solves some, some problems in the industry in terms of reliability of particular locks and uh, these locks are attracting more and more interest from the global distributors. But you'll see that they really work well in terms of consolidation of costs in the past years where we've now consolidated um, both the manufacturing of both products in Auckland. So again, very, very high end customer base uh, in terms of the deployment of these solutions. They're obviously uh, accepted in government space. Uh, in transport and obviously across um, some very big users like Microsoft and some banking customers. Again, uh, distributors will dominate the locks, but um, they will work through a matrix of, of actual system integrators, some of them similar to the ones you would have seen on the FFT slide. Now to talk about the services division, obviously, as I said, they provide uh, international secure logistics. And you'll see a very strong linear growth there from being a startup a few years ago. Obviously, the services business, as you capture a customer, you've really captured a long term, um, almost recurring revenue, although it's not fully contracted, but you know you'll get a percentage of that customer spend. And if you perform well, you'll both maintain that revenue stream from that customer, but you'll grow. And most customers will will spread their risk over two or three providers. So as Ava Global performs, they'll move towards that 30% of the customer spend. Um, there has been some consolidation at the top end of the market where the two biggest providers have combined. So many of the, uh, of the customers that use those services will need to reweight their, uh, their risk. And that's an opportunity for further expansion for Ava Global. But the unique thing about them is that they really do have a unique model. They don't carry all of the CapEx and off OPEX the big players have in each of the countries. Um, what Ava Global does is it actually will have a partner use those partner services when they need to. So they don't carry that, that overhead. They don't have to sweat the asset and they can provide very efficient um, and very cost-effective solutions. COVID-19 impact, I didn't want to dwell on that with the other technology group, but certainly in services, air freight's been a premium. They've been able to secure air freight, so that really helps them underpin strong margins for this particular industry. So just looking at the, uh, the current financials, um, obviously you'll see across the board, there's been you know, great growth. Obviously the services revenue in terms of uh, first half on the prior uh, period have, have had spectacular growth and obviously a positive COVID-19 impact to a degree, but still underlying very strong growth. Technology um, from a revenue um, slightly down, dampened by COVID-19 uh, through that period, 
but overall, the the actual profits um, are still very, very strong, growing very, very strong, because of you know the capability and the the go to market models that we've been implementing and will continue to implement going forward. And we're in a very good, strong financial position with uh, eleven point seven million dollars in the bank reported at half and no debt. So we've provided. FY21 guidance uh, with the forecasted revenue and the EBITDA reflecting the um, $6 million of backlog, the technology divisions moved into FY22. And we're also starting um, to look forward to uh, revenue from partial conversion of the Aura IQ sales pipeline going forward. So as we look ahead, um, obviously new client wins, expansion within the services division, uh, leveraging BQT's distribution partners and expanding long-term maintenance contracts, remote service solutions to start driving that annual recurring revenue. And if you look at the very large in store base, particularly for FFT, that shows a very, very large um, accessible market for the selling of recurring revenue services. Okay, well, thanks very much for um, for the opportunity to present and I'll now open up to questions. Uh, thanks, Rob. Yeah, we've got a plethora of questions to try and uh, get through. So uh, I'll apologize now if we don't get to all the questions, but let's see how we go. Um, I'm going to take one of those. I've got quite a few that are emailed in ahead of time. So let me take one of those first and then I'll switch back to the live questions. Uh, if a risk were made offers for the services division back in 2019, is the sale of this division still being considered by the board? Oh, look, um, look, I think it's just fair to say that, you know, we've always been clear that we'll be opportun opportunistic um, regarding the services division. There's been nothing, uh, no surprise there that, look, there'll always be the right time, there'll always be the right buyer at some point. Um, certainly at the moment, they're growing. We're really happy with their performance. And obviously, uh, that's the way we see it. Uh, they're performing well, will be opportunistic. If, uh, if uh, the right buyer, the right offer would, were to come along, then it would have to be seriously considered. Okay, great. And then I'll take one from the audience here. Um, what is the recurring revenue percentage now? And, you know, is there a target for where you want to get it to in the let's say you know one two three years from now um looks definitely have targets and objectives to expand it significantly um the if i look at the recurring revenue um let's say if we talk about over global it's almost a form of recurring revenue that they're achieving so i'll put them aside if i look at fft um what we're doing is the recurring revenue that we see will come from licensing in that there'll be long-term licensing programs that have high visibility and there'll also be the value-added services that we overlay on all the existing installations that we have so at the moment we've actually just tested out the product in terms of a recurring revenue licensing model for all that install base and obviously it's only a few of the contracts that we've signed to date at least have given us confidence that we can get um, a good amount from each customer as they understand the value and we improve the model of what we provide each year with the software upgrades. At the moment, it's only a, a, a small number of percent that we're achieving that's baked in. Um, we obviously want to multiply that and grow it multiple times, but the other kicker on that will be Aura IQ, which that whole go-to-market model has a very strong recurring revenue component that's, that's baked into it. With you know, we expect that um, you know something like half the revenues that we'll be achieving will be baked in a recurring revenue uh, that we will see building year on year. So I'm not going to have a forecast in terms of prescriptive percentages or, or dollar values, but it certainly is going to be growing because it is a very much a focus of the product that we're products we're developing that they have an inbuilt recurring revenue component. Okay, and then uh, Aura IQ distributors, you know, recent appointments. Um, are you able to elaborate on, you know, exclusivity, industry focus, site type focus, 
you know, minimum performance criteria from the distributor? Are you able to give a bit more color around that, if possible? Um, yeah, so distributor, we, we call them partners because in fact, um, it's not uh, just a classic distributor model. It's, it's very much a value-added partner. We see their focus is really the ability to be in country, on site. They have established relationships, um, established um, you know, uh, history with each of the mines. So the precedence is that they have the right uh, presence, they have the right infrastructure, and they have the right ongoing relationships with the relevant mine for them to be able to support that particular mine. Um, exclusive, they are uh, non-exclusive. Uh, every agreement we put in place will always have some minimum performance requirements for renewing. Um, uh, it's very rare that you'd give exclusivity for anything these days. I, I've um, really, you'd have to be convinced that that one provider can do things that you cannot do through a more a diverse go-to-market. Okay, and then another question I'm going to take that was emailed ahead of time. Um, can you give us a rundown of Avaris go to Mars market strategy for the intrusion tamper detection product? Uh, do you have a pipeline of products? Any indication and in size of this pipeline? Um, well, uh, hopefully with the Aura platform uh, presentation, you'll have an understanding that it is a whole platform that will drive growth in terms of within the security market, adding, you know, really leading, world leading capabilities um, that, that will strengthen our position in that perimeter security market. We can deploy it on fences, on perimeters, we can deploy it buried. Um, so therefore we also have the ability to have multiple layers on perimeters. Um, and obviously the, the sensitivity and the software that we're developing is, is quite incredible in its capabilities. So as we get the product um, and maintain the leading edge capability, yeah, the whole question is the expansion of sales within the security space. And obviously we've got a proven capability and we'll be obviously adding sales resources to drive that growth. And then we take the platform into these adjacent markets or new markets of condition monitoring. And uh, again, I've spoken a bit about that particular focus where we're showing capabilities and attracting interest in that particular space. So we'll, behind that, we have innovations that are ongoing that I can't speak to in too much detail, but we've got a great program of enhancement extension planned for next year. And then one around capital management. Uh, any plans for another dividend given the cash on hand and the you know guidance that's uh, out in the market currently or what's the board's thinking there? Look, um, to be fair, the board does you know consider quite uh, regularly and often capital management strategies, and obviously they'll continue to do so, and and you know we'll we'll make sure that that we are making the most of the the capital that we do have. So it really is the board's focus to make sure that that's effectively managed. Okay, and then another question uh, for on the BQ2, BQT Solutions business, sorry. Uh, September 2015, a large deal for 100,000 units over five years was flagged for the YG80 Aura Lock. Is this deal still in play? Another question. Oh, yes. Um, the deal still is in play. I, yes, absolutely. Obviously, what, what tends to happen is the bigger the deal, the more uh, delays you have. It's a multi-phase program. Uh, which the locking parties towards the end of the program. So therefore um, still in play and um, obviously has been delayed uh, in, the, in the past year. Uh, another one then, monitoring systems of existing sites using FOSS AI tech. Um, are you able to say how many sites customers have been signed up, uh, annual values at the moment? Um, well, that's, it's actually an interesting question. What you're really talking about there is that's that recurring revenue uh, component that I said that we'll be focusing on in terms of enhancement. So we do have the ability already to access the number of sites 
where the customer will agree and allow us to do so. Um, what we want, what we're working on is, and we have got some customers signed up already for multi-year support services that includes us obviously accessing their system within their network and looking at all the sensors and monitoring the system for its internal uh, performance and capability and giving them regular reports on that. So that's actually the phase one of what we've been uh, working on rolling out. That's worked well in terms of all the test sites and the functionality. And now we'll be investing in a um, more of a program manager for global expansion. And we also have some very interesting enhancements to, the, to that particular program, building around annual updates of the uh, cyber assured FOSS platform software, because we see that that ongoing enhancement to improve its, its um, cyber assurance is a key value add. And then on top of that, there is the ability we can provide um, performance enhancements within the software um, using a few innovations that I, I can't cover in this particular call, but we're going to be what we believe is providing compelling uh, reasons for customers to start considering at the time of purchase a multi-year support agreement because of the ongoing enhancements we can provide in terms of cyber assurance and in terms of underlying performance of the system. Yeah, thanks, Rob. Uh, we're going to have to leave it there. Unfortunately, we're even gone a, a bit slightly over time. But Rob, thank you very much for, for joining us some, this morning and, and giving us that presentation. Uh, and as I said, the recording of this will be up on the Coffee Microcaps YouTube channel tomorrow morning. So with that, I will leave it there i'll say thanks to robin all our attendees and wish everybody a good rest of their thursday <laughs>